John Chavez, the founder of the DMT Quest project, met with John Dean in Michigan and dug deep on how to firmly establish whether or not gamma wave activity and endogenous DMT are in any way correlated. Multiple studies have demonstrated that psychedelics will increase gamma frequencies in the brain. You can get at that question in roundabout ways. The easiest and, and most scientific way would be to create an animal that a rat or a rodent that no longer contains the compound that you're interested in studying. And then you can see how that changes the, the brainwave profile. What happens when you do that? If you have these uh, knockout animal models, how does that change their behavior? Does it be change their behavior in any obvious way? A lot of times in biomedical research, you'll use what's called a knockout animal. And a knockout animal is uh, basically a genetic mutant where you've deleted a certain gene of interest and you can go in and study that animal with a hypothesis that it's lacking that gene and you can understand the function of that gene. So what we've done is deleted the gene that's necessary for DMT synthesis in a rat strain. And we're using that rat strain to uh, hope to uncover the functions of endogenous DMT. On the quest to uncover the role of endogenous DMT, an unfinished study out of Louisiana State University may paint a completely different picture on how psychedelic compounds operate in the brain. Something that Stephen Barker did uh, several years ago, he's a researcher at LSU. He's been a, a, a big name in DMT research for the last several decades. They did a, a sort of a pilot study that never got published, and they showed that uh, the levels of um, DMT and 5-MeO-DMT were massively increased in uh, animal brains after the administration of LSD. When we administered LSD to uh, rats, we saw a tenfold increase in the level of endogenous 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine and a fourfold increase in dimethyltryptamine. This suggests that there is a endogenous hallucinogen neuronal system and that many hallucinogens may not actually be true hallucinogens, but endogenous hallucinogen neuronal system agonists, that they stimulate the release of these endogenous hallucinogens, which then carry out their uh, function and on perception. Those results never got published, yet nobody's really funding the, 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 the work for it. We're basically trying to understand the mechanism of action of how psychedelics can bring about these increases in mental health, these treatments for, uh, for a variety of different ailments. If we're able to show, for example, that DMT is massively increased, uh, endogenous DMT is massively increased after a, a administration of LSD or psilocybin, then I think that has massive implications for the future of all psychedelic research moving forward. We're in a really good position in GMO's lab to be able to repeat a study very similar to that. I was hoping to work on that project full time for my PhD. Unfortunately, uh, it re ran into some funding issues, so I wasn't able to do that. That's sort of the, the way science works. Hopefully, uh, one of my, my colleagues, uh, Nick Linos and, and GMO, will, will have some of those answers soon. John wasn't able to continue work in GMO's lab because funding wasn't available. And when I came in, I knew that was a risk. When I came to Michigan, I knew that was a risk that I may not be able to join GMO's lab. I may not be able to do this DMT research because funding may not be available. And I consider myself extremely lucky that we found a way to find funding for me to be able to do this work. Um, and we're still pressured with that every day. We're still pressured with uh, trying to apply for additional grants, looking for funding from, from private sources. Some of the bigger labs at, uh, in, the, in the medical school at Michigan, there's, uh, there's usually you know, a PI, co multiple collaborators. Um, there can be a handful of postdocs, maybe six, eight, 10 postdocs, uh, multiple graduate students, two to three to four graduate students. And then you have research assistants and you have staff people that are, that are working in the lab full time. But with GMO's lab, where I'm working now, it's, uh, there's just three of us right now. And uh, I'm the only one who's really focused on the DMT project. It's important because these are the most important questions in neuroscience, right? With respect to the foundations of consciousness. And it's something that is kind of being overlooked by mainstream neuroscience. 
So again, it's a question of it will take some funding and some support to do this work. And it's among the most uh, important questions being explored in neuroscience. A long-term career goal of mine is to be able to develop a way to non-invasively image DMT in the human brain or in the human body. We're pretty long way off on that, uh, but hopefully within the next decade, it's an achievable goal. Non-invasive research refers to the ability to measure brain levels of DMT without using needles, probes, or otherwise harming the subject. It might also be able to show us whether or not breathwork, meditation, and even dreaming is involved with endogenous DMT, giving us a much better understanding of the neurochemistry of altered states. As John gears up to leave the University of Michigan, the goals of everyone involved in endogenous DMT research is the same. The field needs more funding if we are to understand why the spirit molecule and the God molecule are floating around naturally inside us all. Science takes a very long time. You need multiple groups reproducing the same finding over and over, which still needs to happen with endogenous DMT to establish this as actually being something from a hypothesis more into the realm of theory. I think DMT kind of became that band that opens for Led Zeppelin <laughs> like in the 60s and 70s. Big vision for DMT research is to, to open up the opportunities and get more people involved. I think that's what we really need. Um, I think we've seen with other psychedelic research at Hopkins and at you know, Imperial College of London, they've developed these big psychedelic research centers and, and it shows they're putting out a, a lot of research, a lot of studies, and, and they're extremely successful. And it's, it's really bringing psychedelics back into the mainstream. And DMT, uh, and more specifically endogenous DMT, is still just kind of in the shadows. I think even a small amount of uh, startup funds can really make a big difference. The importance of funding endogenous DMT studies is that it may provide a basis for all psychedelic research into which millions of dollars are funneled. But it could also give us a better understanding of what modulates everyday waking reality, of the neurochemistry of altered and mystical states. What if DMT was the missing link between all religions? What if the foundation of all spiritual experiences might have a basis in biology? Could this help bring humanity together? If we could understand just how Wim Hof is capable of achieving the unbelievable, perhaps the protocols of human optimization are just around the corner. What if this really is a simulation and endogenous DMT was the key? Would the task before us be any different than what the yogis, sages, and mystics called the process of awakening? What if the rapid expansion of the human neocortex had more to do with endogenous DMT than we once believed? What if adaptation of our species to existential and environmental threats wasn't a job for global politics, but an internal responsibility of the collective? What if mental health and the voluntary changing of brain structures was just a few short years of research away? On the quest to scientifically understand being human, we know so little about why the waves collect into atoms and beget molecules and build cells to become organs that make up the form of a species on the brink of an ocean of questions. The answer to this DMT quest is closer than you think. <laughs>